Lord, help us today. We've come to spend time with you. Father, we have a few hours to talk about this subject. Very vital subject, men and money. Lord, the whole world system is run by finance. And as men, we need to know how to be good stewards. And the principles involved. And how to be godly givers. Lord, please help us today. We ask it in your name. Amen. Study number one. I've called it Babylon, the one world monetary system. Whatever we think about Babylon, and, and you know, we can read it in Revelation, we can read it in Daniel. For those who are interested, I've got a 10 one hour series on Babylon, 6,000 years of Babylon. So I'm just going to skirt through a lot of things today. If you want it in depth, we've got the cassettes and the videos. All right, Babylon can be about culture and her politics. But more than anything else, it's about mammon. Read it in Revelation. The fall of Babylon, really, is the fall of an economic system. It talks about all the, the, the material things, the money and the gold and the big long list of material things. Read it in Revelation. And you can't talk about Babylon without bringing finance into it, because finance is the key. It's not politics, it's not religion. It's the key. Let me get into it. Did you know that the Babylonians were the uh, original inventors of, of money, promissory notes, which a pound note is, isn't it? I promised to pay the bearer. A pound note isn't worth anything. It's not worth a pound, is it? You could print probably a thousand pound notes for a pound. So it's not worth anything. It's a promissory note. It says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand. And it's backed up by the gold or whatever. And the Babylonians were the first inventors of promissory notes and title deeds to houses. It came from Babylon. And Babylon is a system, whatever it uses, whether it's politics or commerce, it's a system that accumulates wealth for manipulation. The money is a means to an end, but it's essential to manipulate for control. The control is through money. Um, and it started off uh, in God's economy without money. God didn't say to Adam and Eve, look, be fruitful, replenish the earth, and I've deposited half a million pound in the bank so you can do it. Because that's what we'd say now. I want you to do this and there's the finance to do it. You can't do anything without finance. I want you to go abroad and do that. You need finance for the plane fare. Whatever we need to do, we need money, don't we? Petrol for the car. Food to eat. But to Adam, he didn't give any money at all. It wasn't necessary. So it's not part of God's economy. It's part of this world's system. It came in after the fall. It's part of the corrupt system. And so it slowly started to corrupt. And it started off with a barter system, didn't it? I've got a a barn full of hay and you've got a 20 sheep and I like meat so I say look I'll give you some hay or some corn to make bread with and will you give me a lamb because I like meat and we'd swap and there'd be no money exchange you'd just swap wouldn't you which is a good system isn't it I wish Christians would do that more I try, try and do that with ministries if they want help I say I'll help you I don't want any money and I want some help, and they, they help me with how they can. Our first book was done by that, like that. The man printed the book for us and only charged me for the paper, didn't charge me any labour. That helped us to get our first book published. That was a, a ministry in Holland. And we, we, uh, I went and built a TV edit suite for them. I went there for six months and didn't charge them. They accommodated me and fed me, but I said I don't want any wages. And it's nice, isn't it, when Christians can help each other without money being involved. Yeah. But then they started to use gold and silver and what was ever valuable to then buy the, the meat or to buy the, the wheat. And we changed from, from goods from goods to, to, to money. And it's not so long ago in our country when we used sovereigns 
gold sovereigns. And the gold was worth something. So you bought what the gold was worth. It, it was actually so much an ounce that if the, the value of gold went up, yeah, it was worth more. And so you used to, to, to buy things with gold. And then they made promissory notes and there were bits of paper and it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand and the banks of the world had the gold reserves to back up the bits of paper, didn't they? Because you could go to the bank with a bit of paper and in theory they would give you the gold because it was backed up. But it's gone further than that now. Do you know there's no gold left in the banks to back it up? It's all electronic now, it's all on trust. The gold doesn't exist, Fort Knox is empty. We invested all our gold in Europe, the Bank of England. And so now money is actually only digits going through computers. There is nothing to back it up. We could easily have a world economic collapse because there's nothing to back it up. It's all based on trust. And that's the idea. To create wealth into where it becomes an illusion and you can manipulate without money. Take a, a painting, Picasso painting. If we put one on the wall now, it, I would think it could easily be worth a million pound or a Leonardo da Vinci. There's paintings that are worth five, ten, twenty-five million pound, aren't they? But what's its real worth? Let's look at it, the paintings on the wall. Forget the frame, the frame's probably worth £100, a gold frame, a £200 nice frame. But the actual painting, it's a piece of canvas. At today's money would be a fiver. And the, the, the paint, shall we say £10, £15 pounds worth of paint, that's perhaps worth £25. Why would somebody pay £25 million for something that really is worth £25? It's just paint on, on canvas, isn't it? So it's an illusion, isn't it? Because people will pay what it is worth. The value of any goods is what somebody will pay for it. Mm. If I hold my notes up and say, what will you give me for that? It's worth what you'll give me. If somebody will give me £200 for my notes, well, it's worth £200. If somebody says, I'll give you 5p, and that's the highest bidder, that's what it's worth. And so it becomes worth not what it's worth, but what people will pay for it. And you're paying... That the piece of paper would be a penny, wouldn't it, for those notes? So if you say, well, I'll give you £50 for that, you're not paying for the piece of paper, you're paying for my intelligence. My wisdom that's on paper, do you understand? You're not paying for the commodity, you're actually paying for something that doesn't exist, my wisdom. And so if somebody paid £25 million for it, next time it goes to Christie's or Sotheby's, it's going to be bid more, isn't it? Because the last man gave £25 million for it two years ago, now somebody will give £30 million for it. And it increases in value like that, it goes round in a cycle. Why am I saying all this? <clears throat> well, the new commodity, the new monetary system is nothing to do with finance, it's actually to do with information. The manipulation of the mark of the beast will not be with pounds, shillings and pence because it's disappearing anyway. Aren't we getting a cashless society? When you go with your credit card, some people never see money. They get paid X pounds, say they get £400 a week. I don't know what people get these. Just for, you know, any figure, £400 a week. It goes monthly into their bank account. Electronically, the firm pay into their bank account. They don't see it. And everything they do, they pay credit card. So they never actually handle money. They're handling information. The bank have the information that that firm pays them so much money. But the bank, the, the firm, don't actually pay that much money into the bank, do they? They just send the information. And the bank has the information, you've got so much, and you go to a shop with your credit card, and the shop checks, and they say, oh yes, he's got so much in the bank, but nobody's ever seen it. And they give you the goods, but you've never passed any money over. It just means there's less digits in the bank, because the bank says £2,536. But it's just a figure, and then it goes down with the credit card by how much the goods are. And we're getting this cashless society. So it's the information. And if you control the world's information, you control the world. Yeah. You don't need money. Yeah. 
Can you see how it's going? This is the new monetary system information. Let me, let me read. <clears throat> I don't suppose you've read any of Alvin Toffler's books, have you? Bit heavy going, bit too intellectual for me, but I still read them. But this is the third book. The first one was um, Power Shift, I think. <clears throat> no, that's Power Shift. Oh, I forget what it was. Future Shock, that was his first one. This is his, his last one. And, and, and it's, uh, it's a thick book, but it, it blow your mind if you read it. And I, I just opened it at any page. I thought, I'll just read something from it. And he's talking about this thing. <clears throat> He said, a fighter aeroplane today is the equivalent of a computer with wings. It's not run by people anymore, it's run by computers, can be controlled from the ground. And it's really a supercomputer because it's, it's tracking other planes and sending bombs and it's the computer that flies it. It's the equivalent of a computer with wings. A computer is information, isn't it? That's all it stores, digits. Its effectiveness depends almost entirely on the knowledge packed into its avionics and weaponry and into its pilot's brain in the computer. In 1982, Soviet military planners suffered a collective case of ulcers when 80 Soviet-built MiG fighters flown by the Syrians were destroyed by Israeli pilots who lost not one single plane. Soviet-built tanks also did badly against Israeli army, armour. Even though the USSR had brilliant military scientists and nukes enough to incinerate the world, it could not keep pace in the race towards super high technology conventional weapons or in the dash for strategic defence systems. It was the computers that won the war, not the planes. Because mm. Russia had enough to, to blow up the whole world, but they didn't have the computers. Can you see how the world's going? It's going to be ruled and controlled by information. And he's talking about now that physical manpower and those things are disappearing. He calls it the K-factor. The same K-factor helps explain the fragmentation of the developing countries and the rise of the three distinct groupings among them. For example, once the most advanced economics began to shift to computers and information-based technologies yielding higher value-added products, they transferred many of the old, the old muscle-based, less information-intensive operations to countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. All the factories now and manufacturing is not done in the West. Nearly everything you buy is not made in England, it's made in Taiwan and Singapore. And our economy is based on information. The third world, that's still based on manufacturing. As we were, the Industrial Revolution. But it's shifting now. In other words, as Europe, Japan and the United States move to this third wave, this third wave forms of wealth making, which is what the book's about, they passed off the old second wave, which is manual work, tasks, to another tier of nations. This speeded their industrialisation and they left the lower developed countries behind. Many of these newly industrialised economics in turn are now racing to pawn off second wave processes on still poorer, more economically backward countries. Now China is taking over Taiwan and the East, isn't it? China is the big one now and Malaysia and, and all these countries are now becoming like us, computer based. I won't read anymore. But do you get the, the shift it's going? And the new money will be information. Money was only to create the illusion until it got into non-money, to digits, and then it could be information. It's still money. A piece of gold was money. A piece of paper was money. Information is still money. It's what you use to buy, to buy the souls of men, to trade. So don't think it's not money. Information is now the new currency. Do you understand? First it was gold, then it was pieces of paper that backed with the gold backed up, and now it's information without any physical commodity. Can you see the way it's going? Because you can control the world now. If it's only information, you can store that in a computer. You can't store the world's wealth in a bank vault, can you? But if you've got information on every person on the planet, they can't buy or sell without your information. 
So that's the mark of the beast. Can you see? So this, this creation of money, this Babylon system, is fundamental as a Christian to understand. In the Bible days, it was just shekels, wasn't it? Physical money. The principle's the same. For we brought nothing into this world, I'm reading from Timothy, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be content. He's talking to a young minister, but we're all in the priesthood. We like it when it suits us to say, oh, I believe in the priesthood of all the believers, don't we? Well, the priesthood had no inheritance. <laughs> you weren't normal, were you, if you were a priest? People say, oh, we're all priests, you know. Okay, well, the priests were separated people. They couldn't live like the rest, they had no inheritance. <laughs> Having food and raiment be content, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And this is an amazing statement. Most Christians don't believe it. They read it and, and think they do. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And that's a bold statement for Paul to write. Not, not the root of some evil, but all evil. Which, while some have coveted after, they have erred, through, erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. That's our commodity. That's what we trade with. That's our talents, the character of Christ. He says, don't follow after that, but follow after the character of Christ. That's what you can trade with. That will change people's lives. That will put them in the kingdom of heaven. So to love money must be to love the system. Must be to love worship Satan. Because Jesus says you can't serve God and Satan. No, you can't serve God and riches, mammon. In other words, you can't serve God and Babylon, I could say. There's only two masters and you can't... If you're not worshipping God, you're worshipping money. You don't realise it, but that, that's, that's, that's it. God desires us to love him through worship. Now, by worship, I don't mean singing. I don't mean lifting hands in the air. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's all God requires, love, but you can't show love without worship. They're inseparable. If you really love somebody, they'll say, oh, he worships the ground she walks on. She worships him. They mean, they, they love. It, it, it's Abram, going to sacrifice his son, said, I'm going up yonder to worship. An act of sacrifice, which is an act of love. He only was going to kill his son because he loved God. You don't kill your son unless it's for love. Love or hate. And he loved God. And so they're inseparable. And so God wants us to worship him to prove that he loves us. God needs and wants love. And worship is the way to do it. But I'm, I'm, you, you understand my definition of worship. Obedience, love, like Abram. Now Satan wants to be like God, doesn't he? So therefore he wants worship. And the whole battle... There's not a battle really because God's in complete control. But in that sense, Satan is trying to usurp God. And therefore, Satan's sole primary aim is to get the worship of the whole world. Yes. Jesus, I'll give you the whole world if you'll fall down and worship me. That's what the devil wants. He doesn't want power, he doesn't want money, he doesn't want control. They are means to the end. The end is that he craves worship. He wants to be like God. And just as God doesn't need money, and your time, and your talent, and anything else, neither does the devil. He only uses those because those give him the control. Now God can get worship by revealing himself to us and saying, look, I died for you. I'm worth loving. God is worth loving, isn't he? So all God's got to do is reveal himself to us and we think, wow, he loved me that much to die for my sins. That God's worth serving. 
And so of my free will, if God reveals himself to me, there's a chance that I will love God. Not because he's good to me, not because I've got eternal life, not because he's my, my doctor and my sugar daddy, but because he's worth loving. That's a real Christian. They love God because he's worth loving, regardless of any benefits. I don't love my wife because she lets me have sex with her. I don't love my wife because she cooks me meals, sews my shirt, buttons on my shirt. I don't love my wife for that. That's wrong, isn't it? That's lust if I only love my wife because I can sleep with her. I love my wife because I love her. I don't know why. You just fall in love, don't you? And it's the same with God. Don't love God for the, for the gifts. Love the giver of the gifts. But Satan's got a problem. Because if he reveals himself, you'll hate him. You'll hate him with a, an unbelievable hate if you know his character. A liar, a murderer. You've no idea how, how he is. You've no idea. You only think you do. And if the devil revealed himself in his fullness, just like God can't reveal himself in his fullness, it'd break you. The devil could never, it, it, you couldn't stand it. And so he has to use deception, whereas God uses light and truth. The only way the devil will get people to worship him is through deception. And so he uses the whole system of the world to deceive us through money, through materialism, through knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. He uses all these things to trap us. But... If it doesn't work, he resorts to force, the opposite of love. Love will never force. God will never force anyone. It's God that gave us a free will. It's the devil that will try and take over people's free will. That's why the devil wants to get people drunk, because they give up their own will. And they let another thought in. That's why God wants to get people so tired that they have a breakdown and can't think for themselves so the devil can take over. That's why the devil uses all these pressures of life. Because he wants to take men's free will away. God doesn't want to take your free will away, he'll never force you. And so the devil, when he can't deceive, in the end, he will use force. And that's the only reason that the devil wants the politics, the money, the power, everything else. It's so he can force worship when, you don't, when you're not deceived. The sign of the last times is a great falling away and a deception. And many will be deceived, but for those who won't, in the end, the devil through the Antichrist will reveal himself and force worship. Now, the subject is men and money, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on Babylon. I'll just go through a, a few points till we, uh, till we fill the time. So the emperor of Babylon is not world domination, it's worship. The world domination is only to force worship. What's the definition of Babylon? Well, the word means confusion, but it's a deception, and I've thought of a definition, this is mine. Confusion masquerading as order. I thought that was quite good, do you? This Confusion, but masquerading as order. The new world confusion. No, they don't call it that, do they? It is. They don't call it the new world Babylon, the new world confusion. They call it the new world order. It's all order. We're going to bring world peace. We're going to feed all the people. Everything will be in order. Peace is order, isn't it? Mayhem is, is the opposite of order and confusion. They're going to say, we're going to bring the new world order. But actually, it's confusion masquerading as order. I'm going to call it the new world confusion from now on. It's not an order. It's a lie. It's a deception. This is the great deception that they will bring peace and order. They're actually going to bring mayhem and confusion. And we'll see murder and bloodshed and anarchy as we've never seen before in the reign of the Antichrist. I'm not prophesying that. I don't need to. The Bible's done it for me. The man of lawlessness masqueraded as order. I've never seen it till, till I got that revelation. I thought, wow, they're very opposite. The peaceful one world system. That's what they're bringing in. Now, for that to happen, there needs to be a control. I understand that control is, is part of the process. To And there's, there's things that have to happen. I've got 
one, two, three, four, five things. Let me quickly go through them. Uh, first of all, the trade and commerce has to be one world. Now, that's not far off. 1992, we got the, the one, one trade in Europe. You don't have to go through the customs now, do you? I don't. I could take a van load of tapes and videos to Holland. They never questioned me. I used to have to pay tax on them before 1992, not long ago. But that's sewn up now. And from the EEC, yeah. European Economic Community, as soon as 1992 came and it was tied up, they dropped one of the E's and now it's Economic uh, European Community. They don't want you to think about that because it's all tied up. The second is the politics. And that's, or, or, or maybe the legal. The legal's probably first. And the legal's pretty well tied up in Europe. I'm using Europe because if it's happened in Europe, it can happen in the world. It's happening with America and Canada. America and Canada. They've got a trade block now, haven't they, with Japan. And China has joined the world trade. Imagine China. One and a half billion people, the biggest trade block. In. They'll be the new economic power because they've got one and a half billion people in this manufacturing sector. They, they'll be wealthy. They'll probably take over the world economically. China now. But they're into the world system. They're into the trade. The politics and, and the legal system is pretty well tied up now. I can't pass a, we can't pass a law in England that contravenes European law. You can now take England to court, to Strasbourg, to a higher court. If your government passes a law and you think it goes against European law, you can take them to court as an individual, to a higher court. So whatever we think, we, we've lost our legality, haven't we? And the politics, we've now got a, a constitution. Haven't we? This is the thing that's been passed through. Federal states of Europe, it'll be in, in, in reality if it's not in name. The finance, well, that's pretty well tied up. We're kicking and screaming our way in, aren't we? But it's getting there. Lots of, lots of uh, currencies are getting parity now. The last one is religion. If it's to do with worship, Babylon's to do with worship, read the whore. It's all a false church. Gold and scarlet and purple and the stones, pearls. All the things that are in the New Jerusalem, the Bride of Christ, Babylon has. Because it's to do with worship. Religion's to do with worship. Communism is to do with worship. That's why they have posters. They had posters of Lenin and Stalin all over because it's the kids chant to it, and, and he's our God. It's worship. All, re all religion and politics are to do with worship. Did you know that politics is to do with worship? She masqueraded as many other things, but you only have to see a dictatorship, which is part of politics. You only have to see fascism, and you see the worship come out. In democracy, it's done a more subtle way, but it's still to do with worship, ultimately. Because we'll vote in an antichrist. That's where the world's got to become democratic, so the whole world can vote for this man of peace, and we'll worship him as God. So you need a one world, one world religion, and it's coming. Mikhail Gar Gorbachev, who was the man who, who helped to bring the walls down, do you know he's going around the world now, trying to si sign nations up? to a charter, and the charter is, a, he said, it's a substitute to the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes. He said it's like, you know, the Christian manifesto, and he's going around the world saying to governments, will you sign up to this one world charter? It's like a religious statement to take over the Ten Commandments, that all the world will agree, yes, this is a good charter. And he's doing it, he's going around the world. I read his book, you should read it, it's probably still in print, Gorbachev. Remember, he wrote these books, Perestroika, and these different books. You should read them. As soon as I read it, I thought, this man's not a communist, he's a, he's a new ager. He was actually talking about bringing uh, religion and, and the, of India. He says, what the world needs is these philosophies of India, Hinduism. Hinduism is new age. That's where all the new age teaching comes from, Hinduism. And he was advocating as a communist, but he wasn't a communist, he was a one-worlder. And it's coming in his true colours now, trying to get the world governments to sign up. You can check it on the internet. This is 
I've not made it up. It's quite open that he's going around the world doing this. And he says it's a substitute for all religions. To, so they all agree with this one charter. But when you've got all those tied up, the trade, the, com the commerce, the politics, the legal system, the financial and the religious, then you will get a leader that controls them all. The leader doesn't come until they're all in place. The Antichrist will not come until it's all in place. But when they're in place, he'll come and he'll be the political leader, the religious leader, just like the Messiah, the Jews are looking, aren't they? For a political leader and a religious leader, they're looking for two, the Jews. And the Antichrist will fulfil both. He'll fulfil everything. And he'll be the Antichrist, the king of Babylon. In Babylon, in Daniel's day, who was the man who ruled it? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He's a type of the Antichrist. In the first Babylon, it was Nimrod. You can read it in the Bible. Came from the wrong seed. Seed of Cain, then the seed of Ham, the cursed seed. And Nimrod came from it. And it said, and his... I won't read all the scriptures. He said he built a town and his kingdom was Babel. Babylon, Nimrod. The first king of... First Antichrist. And God scattered it. And Nebuchadnezzar was the second in the Bible that's the type of the Antichrist. And now we're in the, the situation where the next one's going to come, maybe in our lifetime. So let me quickly look at the roots of Babylon. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. And if you understand the system, that it's going away from money to information, you'll understand. Be careful who you give your information to. Be careful of all these surveys that come in round. You can, we'll enter you in a draw to win a new card if you fill in this marketing survey. Be careful. If I fill in and I put a load of long, silly information. How many cars have you got? Ten. How much do you earn? 500 grand a year. I put all stuff on it if I do them. I've done that. Because it's all going in the computer, isn't it? That's how they can target you. The supermarkets are now having electronic shelves that when you take something off, it records that there's a packet of cornflakes gone and they reorder a new one from the factory. And it's there at the night, last minute deliveries. They're also tagging food and clothes. They're tagging them, you know, electronically. You know, you, you, you put your phone on when you go to Belgium and it says, welcome to the network. They know I'm there because I'm connected to a thing. So they have to know I'm there, don't they? So they've tagged me on my mobile phone. It's a tagging system, isn't it? They know where you are. I told you I was in Scotland and I wanted to know the, what the roads were like. And so I typed the thing for the information. And it said, hello, you are here. Turn right at the M52. And it told me how to get out of the trouble on the, on the motorway. They knew exactly where I was from where my phone beamed up the signal. It's a tracking device, you see. And now they're tracking clothes and food so they can actually know what's in your cupboard. They can know what clothes you're wearing at any time so they can... It's all for, tr for commerce, of course, so they can target you. They know that you wear Levi jeans so they can target you. They know you wear this or wear that. They know what food you buy and how much you spend on your bill and it's all tanked. They know where a lorry is on the road with 3,000 hush puppies in. The, the factory who make them know exactly where the lorry is at any time because it's electronically tagged by satellite. And they could tag every pair of shoes. They're doing that now. You know, they can put little chips that cost nothing into every, everything they manufacture. All, all for the sake of economy and getting them cheaper to you so they don't waste money and time. But can you see how it's going? It's information that's the power. But let's look at the roots of it. The roots of Babylon are based on rebellion. Always rebellion. Rebellion ends up in confusion, doesn't it? So chapter 4, I mean this is right at Genesis. The first child, Cain, who killed Abel, started Babylon. Started the rebellion. He killed his brother. And verse 16 of chapter 4, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. What happens when you leave the presence of the Lord? He was never meant to leave the presence of the Lord, was he? 
What happens when you leave the presence of the Lord? What happens when a person, a denomination, a church leaves the presence of the Lord? It's easy to do, isn't it? You don't only end up playing wish drives and shove out me on a Saturday night instead of the Holy Ghost moving. Cain knew his wife, 17. She conceived to bear Enoch and he built a city. God never told Adam to build cities, did he? And he called the name of the city after his own son Enoch. He started to make a name for himself. Why call it Enoch after his son? Why not call it God's city? But he wanted to make a name for himself. And this is the statement of Babylon. Let's make a name for ourselves. And he made a city which God hadn't told him to make a name for himself. And that's what happens. In other words, you create your own environment... Your own environment, Maurice Barrett's environment, my house and my car and my city. Instead of living in God's creation. Have you got the difference? You're switching from God's to my. That's what happens when you leave God. When you're in God's presence, everything is God's. My wages is God's money. My time is God's time. My life is God's life. I'm a steward of it. But when you leave God, it's my time. I give God his 10% so that the rest is mine. It's all mine. I've got 90% to spend what I want. And I've done my duty. I've been a good Christian. You'd be a good hypocrite. When you're in God's presence, 100% is yours. Is God's, I mean. Nothing's yours when you're in God's presence. But when you leave it, you make a name for yourself. My money, my bank account, my holiday, my time, my wife. She's not your wife. God gave you her. And tonight God could take your wife away. Don't get cocky. Your children, they're not your children. God gave you them. You're stewards of what God has given you. Don't ever dare say, my children, my house, it's not yours. That's a man who's not living in the presence of God. A man who lives in the presence of God, everything is God's. All things consist by him. And all things were made for his pleasure. Not mine. Well, somebody agrees anyway. There's a hallelujah from the back row. Preach it. And from that very seed of Cain, verse 17, chapter 4. Sorry, verse 20. From that seed we get the three sons. Jabel, the father of such as dwell in tents and of cattle. That's beginnings of commerce. And his brother's name was Jubal, the father of all of such humble, handle a harp and the organ. That's where musical instruments came from, the bad seed. God gave you a musical instrument. It's called your voice. To praise God, to sing. You can praise God through anything. But God already gave you one. At Zillah, she also bare Tubalcane, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, sculpture, the arts. And you can see all this, this seed that helps to control people and make other things gods. Ballet dancers are gods. Gr great musicians are gods. And it's just, great sculptors are gods. Great painters, Leonardo da Vinci. All he's doing is putting paint on a canvas. You can do that. But he's become a god because he was good at it. And people will pay millions of pounds for a creation that God never intended. He said made no graven image, didn't he? A painting's a graven image. Painting God's countryside. Isn't that amazing? 25 million pounds for a constable. But the haystack doesn't blow in the breeze and the cows don't move and the water's not rippling. You can get it for free. You can go to Norfolk or Suffolk and see the same scene that Constable painted and you pay 25 million and you can go and see it for free and the birds actually move across your horizon and the sun sets. It's unbelievable. And you pay 25 million to look at something that's dead and doesn't move. Fool. I say fool. Because if the economic collapse comes, that'll be worth two half crowns, won't it? It won't be worth anything. 
Do you remember in Germany after the last war and people take a, a wheelbarrow of Deutschmarks to buy a loaf of bread? A wheelbarrow full of money. It was worth nothing. And we at school had, had a, a five million Deutschmark note. It's all an illusion. It's all an illusion, you know. Fools, aren't they, really? And we've got it for free. Because everything is God's. He said, don't make graven images. Don't make the likeness of anything. Birds and fish and... You hang up what you want in your house, but... So we've got the two seeds. We've got the seed of Cain. But we've got the good seed. And what did they do? To do with worship. They worship God. Verse 26. And to Seth which was the replacement for the good seed, Abel. To him also there was born a son, and he called him Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Worship came from the good seed. Worship of Satan came from the bad seed. But the worship was through commerce, through the arts. Can you see how it came? But men began to call on the name of the Lord. They didn't build cities. They began to worship God. And, and ever since we've had the two seeds, we had Noah and the flood, didn't we? And we started again. And then we got the two seeds. Ham got cursed. The bad seed. And Nimrod came from, from that. And we've got Babylon. Genesis 11. And the earth was of one language and one speech. We've got the one world system. Amazing, isn't it? It's happened before. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain and listened to the statements of Babylon. And they said one to another, this is the statement of Babylon, let us go and make brick and burn thoroughly and brick for stone and slime for mortar. Building, towns, cities. Can you see the, what Babylon's to do with? Let's build a city. People think, oh, the Tower of Babel. They, they don't read the rest. It's to do with, let's build a city. Can you see how it's to do with Babylon cities? Getting people, millions of people together, all living like chickens in a hen hutch. God never intended that. Multi-storey flats, did he? He expected us to have some green grass around us. Some kids, all they see is concrete. If you ask where did they get milk from, they don't know it's from a cow, they say Asta. Where do you get milk from Asta? They don't know. Some kids have never seen a cow. They're looking at the computer games all day and concrete walls and a concrete playground. They never see the green grass. I'm serious. You'd be amazed. Let's build a city and a tower that may reach to heaven and let's make a name for ourselves. There's a whole study in there, the statements of Babylon. Let's make a name for ourselves. My city, my town, my church, my job, my wife, my children. Anything with my in front of it is, is wrong. It's Babylon. Isn't it? Make a name for yourself. It's mine. Fancy the church empire building. Every denomination by default is Babylon. Let's make a name for ourselves so we're not scattered. Let's get all these churches together. We'll have a bigger clout with the government. We can pool our finance. This is all a statement of Babylon so we're not scattered. God wants us to be scattered. He scattered them. He says, I'm sending you out a sheep among wolves. What do the wolves do? Scatter the flock. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So they stayed in Jerusalem. So God sent persecution and scattered them because they wouldn't be obedient. The early church wanted to build a church in Jerusalem, didn't they? So God says, I'll scatter you. And he did. And we're still trying to build denominations and empires, aren't we? And God's still trying to scatter us where we'll let him. Well, that was the first one. God scattered it. Daniel's day. Same thing, read it. Is this not great Babylon that I have built? Was that not the statement of an antichrist? This is not this great Babylon that I have built. Golden stat the statue. Now that Babylon is still going. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon has not finished. It wasn't the second, well it was the second Babylon. There's no third Babylon. We're still in the Babylon of, of Nebuchadnezzar because God said you're the head. And the whole statue was, was Babylon. 
But he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, and then will come the Medes and the Persians, the silver, and then will come the, the, uh, the middle, the bronze, was it? The Greek that was split into four. Then will come the Roman Empire, the iron, and then we'll get the feet of clay. But it's all a statue, it's all Babylon. And the vision was that in the last days a stone will come and not smash the head, it's never been smashed yet. Do you know the head's not been smashed? The, the, the next part hasn't been smashed, it's continued down, it's the feet that get smashed. And when the stone hits the feet, the whole statue crumbles, the whole of Babylon won't fall. Great is the fall of Babylon, it's because it's a few thousand years old. The system that started with Nebuchadnezzar has continued to this day. All our culture is based on Babylon. All the Anglican and Catholic uh, church and regalia is built on Babylon. The vestments and everything. All our philosophy. Aristotle and Plato, all our philosophy. All our law, Roman law, it's all the statue. All our Greek, the Olympic Games, Greek. Body beautiful. Developing a body was the Greek. They ran naked in the Olympic Games, didn't they? Body beautiful and culture all comes from the Greek. Our monetary system, the decimal Roman, in tens. You can't think of anything. All our maths, Pythagoras theory. Pythagoras, that's Greek, isn't it, Pythagoras? All our music, scales, Aeolian scale, Lydian scales, Mixolydian scales. All our music, based on Greek. Well, can you think of anything else that's not based on Babylon? I can't. Our law. We have Roman law and different laws. No, everything you can think of is on that statue. And the whole world is now being Babylonianized, or whatever the, the word is. Because the whole world is taking on the Western Babylonian culture. We're not playing Chinese music. The kids are not playing Chinese music. They're not playing African music. Africans are playing rock music. China are playing hip-hop and our music. And our culture and our fashions and Hollywood movies and our sexual perversions. They're spreading throughout the whole world. That statue will fill the whole world. So I'll just finish by reading from Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our gathering together unto him. Oh yeah, for me, that's the rapture. Whenever it happens, we're not debating now. But don't be soon shaken or troubled in mind. He said, this day will not come until there be a great falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed the son of damnation. I think all the theologians say that's the Antichrist. Whatever their eschatological sort of doctrines are, they, they accept that this, this man of sin, of damnation, perdition, is the Antichrist. But listen, who opposeth, this is the rebellion that Cain started. Rebelled against God and left God's presence. That's rebellion. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, can you see it's coming out in the open now? All that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, that's in Jerusalem, showing himself that he is God. Proving that he is God. I haven't time to read it, but Revelation 13, it says that the, the anti-Holy Spirit, the false prophet, will bring fire down from heaven and make a statue, just like Nebuchadnezzar, that the whole world must worship. And you won't be able to buy or sell without it. It ties it all up to the statue. It ties it up to music. Nebuchadnezzar said, when the music plays, worship. That's why the world is besotted by music. Music is an integral part of witchcraft. It always has been. Everyone who's in the occult is into music. Hitler said, you cannot understand National Socialism, meaning Nazism, unless you understand the music of Wagner. Now, why would he say that? Because it's a part of it. Witchcraft and music go together. Music, sexual perversion are all part of witchcraft. Drugs also are a great part of it as a tool. It says Babylon will seduce the whole world by her sorceries. And if you look up the Greek word sorcery, pharmakia, which is where we get pharmacy from, drugs. The whole world will be seduced by witchcraft through drugs. That's what sorcery is. Witchcraft with drugs. And that's why we've got a drug academic uh, 
in the whole world. I'm not only talking about kids who are a main line in heroin. I'm talking about Christians on Valium. You'd be amazed how many drugs, chemicals... Now, medicine is good. God put things in, in, in the earth for us to heal us. I'm not talking about natural medicine. I'm talking about synthetic medicine. And most of the medicine that your doctor prescribes is synthetic. It's actually chemicals and not medicine. They're supplying you drugs, not medicine. Be careful what you take because they have side effects and they're part of the seduction of the whole world. It says Babylon has seduced the whole world through her sorceries. It's part of witchcraft. Many of the drugs you get may deal with the symptoms but will give you an altered state of consciousness. Many drugs alter your state of consciousness, just like LSD. Milder drugs do it in some Valium. Gives you relaxation and peace. It's a lie. Your circumstances haven't changed. Be careful what you take when you're stressed. Because they don't alter the situation. They deceive you. It's part of the seduction. To accept the Antichrist. Believe me, music and drugs are being used to prepare the whole world. And Christians are not wised up to it. Let, let me finish there. It's a massive subject, Babylon. And, and the subject really is money. I just want you to know that the new currency, if you only get that today, that the new currency is information. That's how they'll control you. It's just as valuable as money. Companies are, are getting millions of pounds selling databases of your information. It's the new currency. Lord, please help us. Lord, I don't know where to start and finish with this subject. It's so big. But I just pray that something will have gone into our hearts, some little seed that will galvanise us into a new thinking, a new awareness of what's happening to our world, so that we'll be able to understand what to do with our money, how to value it, what it's all about. Help us, Father. Amen.